for our um, uh, text this week, I uh, believe Miss Kristen, Kristen, are you ready? Come on up and read, please. I said do an extra good job this morning. She said no problem, so let's see how she does. Good morning, church. Today I'll be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 6, <laughs> verse 1 to 10. Would you please all stand with me? Let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who are believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, revealing evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Father in heaven, for our time together as we worship you, as, Lord, we pray, and now we listen to your word and ask you to minister to us, minister to our hearts. Lord, your word, all scripture, is given by inspiration. Your word is powerful. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. So I pray today that you would change us through the truth, change our thinking, change our attitudes, help us, Lord, to have your attitude. Father, Lord, if there's any who are unsure of their own salvation, we pray that you would work in that person's heart, that they may know Jesus Christ too, that they may come to faith in him. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the, today's message is called Final Instructions. Someone came up to me and said they thought that said uh, the final solution or something, but no, it's not the final solution. It's not the final countdown. It is final instructions. This week and next week are finishing up the last chapter in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And over the next two messages, this week and next week, uh, we're going to see the apostles' instructions regarding four groups of people. The first group, or the first two we're going to look at today. Next week, we'll look at the second two. The first two today is Christian slaves and then false teachers. Uh, next week, pastors and then those that are rich in this world, those that are wealthy and have much. So today, we're going to look at the first two groups in these 10 verses that Kristen so well read this morning. The first couple of verses is to slaves that are Christians. Now, as I was looking through this, I, you know, I realized this is specifically written to slaves at the time. They're believers. They come to know Christ. Paul has some instructions for them, how they're to live, how they're, how they're to conduct themselves. <clears throat> at first, I thought of changing it to, you know, just call them employees and employers, uh, but, you know, that's dealing with application that we can make, but it was specifically written to those who were still slaves in the Roman Empire at the time, and remember, uh, estimates during this time are that the, of the population, it was some 40 to 50 percent consisted of slaves and slave labor. So it was a huge part of the culture. It was a huge part of the economy. It was how things functioned at the time. That was throughout the Roman Empire. Um, and so it would be natural, of course, as the gospel is going out far and wide, some of those who are coming to faith would indeed be in this category of 
they're slaves. Uh, I've discussed this slavery in the Roman Empire before. Some were slaves by conquest. The Roman Empire was conquering all uh, nations around them, and they'd bring in many slaves. Others were voluntary slaves, that is to pay a debt, to pay, pay off things. If they, instead of going bankrupt, they would sell themselves into slavery for a period of time to pay off that debt. But it was a common way of life at the time. Now, I hate slavery. Um, I don't think it is uh, the right thing. I don't think it is biblical. I don't think it is a godly way to look at people. And, you know, it's just one of those difficult things for me uh, to look at. uh, But I must be objective about it. And as I take a look at history of slavery, I'm disgusted by it. And even to see sometimes Christians included in it, you know, it's a wrong thing. But here we are. So the first point deals with instructions for Christian slaves. Many of these slaves would have been educated and cultured, but they were still not considered or given the status of a person at all during this time. The gospel message, however, was one that brings freedom. It was the message of freedom in Christ. We were once slaves in bondage to sin, but Christ sets us free. And you have to understand and realize this kind of a message would indeed be very appealing to someone who was sold as a slave. To finally have that freedom. They may not have the physical freedom in their immediate circumstances, but they would have freedom in Christ and a newfound Genuine, eternal, everlasting freedom. A freedom from sin. A freedom knowing that in Christ they are accepted. In Christ they have a a home in heaven waiting for them. Very uh, compelling indeed to them. The gospel was going out. And people were being saved. And surely among them, slaves too. But there was a problem. And Paul wanted to briefly address this. Some were using this newfound freedom in Christ to disobey, if not defy, their masters. And Paul wasn't teaching them, you know, cultural upheaval and we got to overthrow the system, overthrow the government. The focus was on Christ and bringing people to Christ and making, let, letting Christ make them new creations, new creatures in him. So the two categories, as we're talking about Christian slaves, the first is Christian slaves with unbelieving masters, and the other is Christian slaves with believing masters. First, he deals with the Christian slave that has an unbelieving master or masters. In verse 1, he says, let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count your own masters worthy of all honor. So that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. The two things in this verse indicating unbelieving masters. The first is that they had their slaves under the yoke. That expression is that they they had a yoke upon them. A yoke is a burden. A yoke is that thing that that holds an animal in place to pull a cart or something. And and so for a master to be referred to as having their uh, slaves under the yoke is referring to that. And the admonition here not to tarnish the name of Christ in front of them. So this indicates that he's talking here to those whose masters are not believers. Okay? Don't tarnish the name of Christ. Was slavery wrong? Yes. But even in this circumstance, the important thing that Paul was explaining to them, your mission, your goal is to bring honor and glory to Christ. Your goal, your mission is to lift up Christ and let the gospel be made known. And let it be made known in your lifestyle, in your heart, in your attitude as well. And so he's talking to these. Honor the name of Christ with them. And then there's an um, um, <clears throat> example in the Old Testament. If you recall Joseph. Do you remember Joseph. Joseph had some brothers. What did they do with him? They sold him. They didn't like him. 
he bothered them. And so they sold him into slavery uh, to Egypt. He was forced to work in Potiphar's house. Potiphar bought him, and so he was a slave in this rich guy's house. What would be the normal human response? What would be the normal human response to this? If you were Joseph, you were sold cruelly by your brothers. Now you're a slave in this rich guy's house in Egypt. The normal response would be, of course, anger. You're going to do as little as possible. Uh, You're not going to serve them uh, with your heart, that's for sure. What do we see Joseph doing? We see the example in Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. And the story goes on that he elevated Joseph to a position of honor and responsibility and trust. I'm not going into all the story of Joseph But I am focusing on Joseph's attitude, even in this position that he was in, sold as a slave in Egypt to this uh, fellow Potiphar. And his attitude was, I'm going to, I serve the Lord. And God blessed him for it. And he was an example, and he uplifted the name of God even before unbelieving Egyptians at this time. God used him. God used uh, um, Joseph. God used him. Paul and others were not going around trying to militantly destroy the empire's social order. That wasn't their intent. Even in it, they were urging believers, slave believers, to bring glory and honor to God. That leads to the second group, Christian slaves with believing masters. There were some of them too because, again, the gospel was going out. There may be some wealthy people, they had slaves in their household that they were responsible for, that they took care of, that they uh, used for running things, and they also became born again. Verse 2, and those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited, are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. He was encouraging that group, those who have believing masters. He encouraged them not to take advantage of the born-again master and that, because they saw them now as brothers. And so, I'm a brother in Christ, you're a brother in Christ. And they would... Basically, take advantage of that situation, of that fact. Why? Well, they were brethren. They are beloved. They are believers. And Paul is saying, don't be worse because now your master is a believer as well. I was reading um, from writer and um, commentator Warren Wearsby. He says, I recall counseling a young lady who resigned from a secular job to work in a Christian organization. Doesn't say what organization, but a Christian organization. She had been there about a month and was completely disillusioned. I thought it was going to be heaven on earth, she complained. Instead, there are nothing but problems. Are you working just as hard for your Christian boss as you did for your other boss, I asked. The look on her face gave me the answer. Try working harder, I advised, and show him real respect. Just because all of you in the office are saved doesn't mean you can do less than your best. She took my advice, and her problems cleared up. So what application can we take from this? Uh, I think we need to make application to our lives from the topic of slavery here. What application can we take? Uh, I believe we can take something very similar. 
That is, serve your boss well. If your boss is the most ungodly rat bag and you know he never would want to set foot in church in his life, uh, serve your boss and work well, seeking to make them prosper and seeking to make them look good. Serve them well. And elsewhere, the Bible encourages believers to do all things as unto Christ. Do all things as unto God. Serve your boss, but you first realize you are serving the Lord God, even in that situation. So serve him well and seek to make him prosper. Why? Not just so your boss can get rich or so, you know, so that you can get promoted. But for the Lord's sake, for the name of Christ's sake, to be a good testimony so that perhaps in God's grace and goodness, even someone like that may come to know Jesus Christ as well. That's your desire. That's your goal. If your boss is a Christian, then what? The admonition here is don't slack off because of it. It's okay. We're both brothers in Christ. Uh, don't need to work so hard. He understands, you know, we're, we're good. Uh, no, uh, don't do that. Um, serve him just as faithfully, serving the Lord in the process. Now we come to number two, though. We dealt with the Christian slaves Number two, though, is an explanation regarding false teachers. False teachers. Paul started this letter warning about false teachers in the first chapter. He refuted some of their teachings in between. And now in the conclusion chapter, he's also once again going back to this warning. He goes back to this warning. <clears throat> um, it's important. It's important. There is so much bad teaching and even false teaching available to people today unlike ever before. Now, I realize in the last 20 plus years, we've seen the rise not just of the information age uh, that, that, was, that was coming into effect, but really blossoming, uh, especially through things like social media, Facebook began in 2004. Some of you are so young, you don't know, you've never lived without social media. You've never lived in a time without social media. Raise your hand if that's you. Your whole life, there's been social media online. I know, I can tell by looking who you guys would be. Uh, but it's not that old. It's not been around that long. 2004, Facebook. Before Facebook, 2003 was the launching of another one called MySpace. Wow. Yeah. And in 2002, there was one called, you guys, Friendster. Yeah. And, and there were numerous other small, not as well known names even before that. But we're really talking in the mid 2000s, it coming into its own. 20 years. YouTube kicked off in 2005. Uh, it was a smaller operation, but in 2006, it was bought out by Google. After a year, they paid, Google paid $1.65 billion, U.S. billion, for Google, uh, um, uh, uh, Face, no, YouTube. They spent $1.65 billion in 2005, or six. Uh, these things, it's been fantastic, hasn't it? Look, uh, it's, been, it's been a blessing. Like so many things that come along, they are a blessing and there's a curse too. When uh, Facebook came along, I was tickled. I thought this is great. And I caught up with so many people I had lost touch with. And I was able to communicate with them. And, I, you know, that's what it was uh, for. Uh, connecting people together, closer together. And as I was so far away, I mean, I'm in New Zealand and got a lot of friends overseas and... We were able to connect in a really neat way. But like so many things, it does have a dark side. The dark side, there's a lot of junk. There's a lot of bad stuff on it. Uh, focusing just on the Christian content, though, 
There's everything from good, solid Bible teaching available to really strange, cultic, quasi-Christian stuff. Conflicting teaching, things that conflict with the, the Scriptures. Um, and the more you watch, the more you uh, check things out, the more it recommends to you things that are very similar. And so you end up going down these rabbit holes of certain direction. And that can become a problem. In fact, I know it has been a problem many times and for many people. If you happen to watch uh, a video on how perhaps Jesus was actually an alien come down to earth and Mary and Joseph were lizard people, well, guess what? You're going to start seeing other videos popping up here and there on your feeds and saying, hey, have you seen this one? This guy has more information to add, and you keep going, and you keep going. This is the dark side of these wonderful things. Now, I realize I cannot possibly keep up and speak on every weird teaching that is out there. That's not possible. One thing I am praying about, one desire I have is to be able to <clears throat> help teach something that I think is often missing, and that is just simply biblical focus, critical thinking. We need to think very critically, but biblically, about things so that when we are shown things or when we go down certain paths, we can say, wait a second, this, there's a problem here. It's not right. It's not adding up. It's not based on truth. The source isn't right. The, it's not truth. The Bible urges us, in fact, to reason together. And one thing I want Christians to understand is that having faith is not the same. It's not synonymous with the suspension of reason. You don't have to suspend reason to have faith in God. You don't have to suspend reason to have saving faith in the gospel of Christ. We're urged to reason together. The apostles, when they were preaching the resurrected Christ, their message was based on the facts of the witnessed resurrection that they all were witnesses of. And they urged people to see these things and to understand these things and to reason these things with them. Having faith is not a leap of faith. It's not a blind leap of faith. And it is definitely not the suspension of your reason. We need to be aware and we need to be careful of these things. So, let's first look at some marks of these false teachers that Paul is referring to. What are some of the marks of them? Some of the description. First of all, they refuse to adhere to sound doctrine. Verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. He's talking about uh, people who are not adhering to these words, to the sound words, to the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Wholesome words here simply means uncorrupted. Uncorrupted. The focus is on the word, though, the words of Jesus. This is a person who always is looking. Uh, the, 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 the false teacher that Paul is describing here is a person that is always looking for something that everyone else has missed. I'm going to show you something. Nobody else has found this. This is so cool. This is really different. And if ever I stand before you and I come up with something like that and I say, listen, guys, I've been studying the word and I don't know if you know this, nobody else has seen this, that ought to be a caution flag. That ought to be a caution flag. I'm not here to reveal new information to you. God has revealed the information to us. I am here to point you to his word and help you understand what God has already given to us and what he has said. That's the purpose of preaching and that's the calling of the pastor, that's the calling of our church. Um, so if somebody says, I have something nobody else has ever seen, be careful of that. There's been too much of that. 
something that might make them look smarter or might get attention or might sell a book even better. You know what topics that Christians really like to use to make money with? There's a topic in particular that many have made a lot of money over the years with. And that topic is end times. Because it's fascinating. And it grabs people's attention. And they want to know, more, especially if you come up with a topic that you say nobody else has seen before. And let me share it with you. Buy my book. It's fascinating. I'm not talking about good doctrinal expository books on the word of God about the subject of end times. What I'm talking about are the ones that always claim to have connected the dots that nobody else has or that everyone else missed. Cracking the code that has been hidden for, from everybody else. Over the years this has gone on and it's not, it's not good for the body of Christ. Numerous claims and prophecies in recent times during the pandemic times, there's been a lot of that kind of stuff. Ten years ago, there was a whole rash of new books out <clears throat> about a topic. I don't know if you remember it, but about blood moons. And how that there's a special sign, something big. And, and there was a number of them. 2011 was the year that Harold Camping predicted the rapture of the church. Sold a lot of stuff. 1988 was the year that Hal Lindsey wrote a book detailing when Christ would definitely come. Teacher, writer, who's no longer with us, Pat Robertson, wrote and spoke of some time in 1984. God told him that he was to usher in the coming of my son. Chuck Smith before that. Convinced many that the end time would be and the rapture time would be at the end of 1981. He wrote books on that, spoke often about it. 1980, December, what's the last day of December 31st? December 31st comes, the people are coming to the church, not expecting to have to go home later that night. And eventually, well after midnight, they had to start to go home realizing they're having to face the next year. kind of humorous, but it's kind of sad. And this kind of thing bothers me because I can't help but see and realize that this puts a, a dent in the credibility of the witness of Jesus Christ constantly, over and over. And when the Bible talks about those, like Peter says, in the in last times there will be scoffers, saying, where is the coming of the Lord? I can't help but think that off, a bit of that responsibility falls on believers for all this kind of stuff. Because we've said it over and over again. Yeah, he's got, yeah look at this sign. Look at this. Oh, I can know something that everyone else has missed. This is what's going to happen. And after a while, it's like the Christian form of Aesop's fable. The boy who cried wolf. And there have been many before even this doing the same thing for years and centuries prior. All these have to go outside of what God has given to us. God has given us much and we as Baptists, we talk about the sufficiency of the word of God. The word of God is sufficient. That means it's complete and it is all that is necessary for a life of godliness and a life of pleasing service to the Lord. It is fully sufficient. But these that Paul is referring to did not adhere to that, did not adhere to the sound doctrine, but was looking for something nobody else knew, losing credibility in the process. So they... Uh, refused to adhere to sound doctrine. Number two, though, they were proud. Verse four, he is proud, knowing nothing. How do you be proud knowing nothing? Okay. He's proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. He's obsessed 
with the little points and minute details. From which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. He's talking about the proud, those with conceited attitudes. One with a conceited attitude ends up arguing over many things. Like he says in verse 4, he argues over words, that is, small uh, details. Oh, do you, you missed this particular word and he can build a whole doctrine around it. This word for words here is used only this one point in the New Testament. That's it. This is a special word. When it says in uh, verse 4, he is proud knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. The normal Greek word for words is logos. This is not that. This word is, means especially a disputation about trifles. The small things. Trifles. Useless wrangling. Um, leads to people not getting the truth. That's why it's, he says they were destitute of truth. They were proud though. What is the motive of their teaching? We see a couple of marks of their teaching. They refuse sound doctrine. They were proud. What's the motive? Verse 5 reveals the main motive. Who suppose that godliness is a means of what? Means of gain. Gain. What is that referring to? Money. Money. They're using... Uh, the things of God, they're using ministry uh, with a focus on making lots of money out of it. Paul was always careful not to give the impression that the ministry is a business. Because it's not. It must never be. Um, <clears throat> from speaking of these prideful teachers, he goes on to give four useful facts regarding wealth uh, for the Christian to keep in mind. So he mentioned these uh, false teachers and their motive, but he almost takes a detour here to make sure you understand how you're to view a wealth. And so first, in verse 6, he says, wealth does not bring contentment. He says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Wealth doesn't bring contentment. Joy, peace, security, it doesn't bring contentment. He wants you to understand that. Contentment here... This word means an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. That's contentment. How many of you guys always have great circumstances every year? You have plenty of income, plenty of money. You have no financial troubles. You have no relational troubles, family troubles, difficulties. The truth is we all go through these things. If we're honest, we all go through times where circumstances are not fantastic. But contentment can be had in Christ despite circumstances. And it's not going to be found in money and wealth either. If that was the case, the wealthiest people would be the most content and happy and peaceful people. But that's not the case. If you depend on wealth for peace... You will never be satisfied. True contentment comes from godliness in the heart, not in wealth. And so he urges you uh, to remember, wealth does not bring contentment. Second, he says, wealth is not lasting. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing out. When I was younger, I always remember preachers talking on this verse, especially at funerals, reminding people, you never see a funeral procession with the hearse in the front and the casket and the person who passed away driving down the road and towing behind the hearse a big U-Haul trailer with all their goods and possessions. You never see that. 
So if you have a rich uncle or aunt who died and someone asked, well, how much did they leave behind? Your answer is all of it. They didn't take anything with them. They left everything because that's what the Bible tells us. We came with nothing, and that's the same way that we leave, with nothing. In fact, those with great wealth and riches, often uh, it's left behind for family to fight over or for the government to take a big share of it. Um, it's just wasted, wasted. So go out and spend it all before you pass away, okay? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not teaching that. <clears throat> uh. Wealth is not lasting. The third thing he says is our basic needs are met, though. Verse 8, having food and clothing. Having food and shelter can be a, a, a descriptive word here. That includes our clothing. That includes our, you know, something over our heads to protect us. Uh, with these, we shall be content. Are you content with these? Uh, those who adhere to prosperity gospel need to memorize this verse. Prosperity gospel kind of teaches you not to be content. Prosperity gospel teaches you that if you really love God, if, if God, uh, you know, is in your life, then you can have that bigger house you always wanted. You can drive the best cars, and you can get the best, because after all, doesn't God own everything, and doesn't He love you? Doesn't He want to bless you, and and with all these things, we have to affirm yes, but we understand that's not how God works. God is a father, isn't he? That's why we pray. He, Jesus taught us when you pray, pray our father in heaven. And so as a father, I mean, I, I've been a father for a long time, and when my kids were young, we didn't just give them everything they want because we understood if we do that, it will ruin them. If we do that, they will not learn. They will not grow. And there were times we loved to gift them something because it brought us joy. Their birthday comes along, and we, we love to you know, surprise them with something. And that's, that's what a father does. But we have a perfect father, a heavenly father. How can we assume that he's going to just be a dispenser, dispensing out all these things for people who demand it from him? His children demanding it. Having food and clothing, with these things, be content. God takes care of us. And then fourthly, we see the desire for wealth leads to sin. He says in verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Quite descriptive. Those who desire wealth, if that's your goal in life, it's a bumpy road ahead. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. What's the root of all kinds of evil? The love of money. Don't say money. Okay, some people say, well, money is the root of all kinds of evil. No, that's not what the Bible is teaching. But loving money, use money. Don't love it. Use it. Provide for your family. Provide for them. Provide for your clothes. Provide for the ministry. Provide for our, our missions. Use money, but we don't love it. We must not love it. It's the root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He's talking here about those who desire to be rich. They look to wealth to feel happy and feel successful. If that's the case, they're going to be disillusioned, and you never get there. You never get to the point where you say, I did it. I have enough money now. I'm happy and successful. I'm content. Never. But if your contentment is found in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, your bank account can go up and down, and it doesn't change your contentment. It doesn't change your contentment. You don't love money. The desire for wealth leads to sin. Riches, in turn, lead to a trap, lead to bondage, not freedom. You want freedom? That's in Christ. 
That's in your relationship with him, not in things. Be mindful of this. So Paul, in talking to us about and warning us about these false teachers and what, they're, what they look like, he takes an opportunity to remind you this is how you're to view wealth. This is how you're to view money. And I think it's very pertinent. It's, it's very uh, useful for today. I think it's timeless, timeless truths. So we started with two verses on the right attitude, in particular, of slaves. Yes, they were slaves, but the application for us is valid. Represent Christ well, whether your boss is a believing boss or an unbeliever. You represent Christ well. You honor the name of Christ. Don't take advantage of a Christian boss. Then we see warnings of false teachers. They don't adhere to sound teaching. They're always looking for something extra, something different, something out there. And they are proud. The motive is often related to money. And then Paul taught us some of these truths about money and about wealth to remember. Don't forget these. As we leave this place, may our thinking be biblical. May it be correct. May it be right. May it be changed. It's so easy for us to slip into a worldly mindset. And today is is another glimpse, a snapback to a biblical mindset as we view life, as we view wealth, as we view the things that we absorb on media, internet, social media, YouTube, as we uh, are cautious about uh, the Christian teaching that we consume, be mindful. Is it biblical focused? And be mindful about money. What's your view of money? Is it your goal to be rich? Or are you viewing money as a tool to use in service to the Lord? Stand with me, if you would, please. Just a couple of moments. A couple of moments to respond in our hearts, if we would, to the teaching of the Word. These ten verses in 1 Timothy chapter 6. What is the Lord convicting you about? What is he speaking to you about right now? You need to respond to him. If it's conviction over a wrong attitude, you need to respond with the heart that says, Lord, forgive me and list it out to him. Forgive me for what it is. Lord, help me to have a biblical mindset, the right focus, and to serve you with my life. If there's anybody here, this has not been particularly a gospel message about the death and resurrection of Christ and what it was for, but if there's anybody here who is not sure of their own relationship with God, and it's a Concerned to you, I I just want to put the invitation out and urge you to come and see me after church. Pastor Ken, I'm not sure if I know the Lord. I'm not sure if I am saved, if I am forgiven. But this is really something that is concerning me, and I want to settle this in my life. Please do that. I'm here, and we'll make arrangements, and we'll settle these things together through the Word of God. I'll give you just a moment to pray and to deal with what God is speaking to you about in your heart right now. For honoring Him in our work with unbelieving bosses, believing bosses. Our caution against false teaching And our own view of wealth and loving wealth and money. Whatever God is speaking to you about, go to him now. Confess. 
and ask him for power and strength to live pleasing to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, I do pray that our attitudes would be different as we leave with this understanding, with this passage in our minds, as we go about our business, be it school or work, with unbelievers or with believers, may we honor you. Lord, help us to be cautious and mindful of poor teaching, things that are mixed, things that lead me down wrong paths biblically. Lord, help me to be grounded in your word. And I pray, Lord, that um, I'd be cautious whenever someone says they have something nobody has seen. Be mindful of that. Father, um, help us to have the right attitude, mindset about wealth and money too. But it's not something we love. It's not something that is our goal in life. But it's a tool that we want to use in serving you with our lives. Thank you, Father. Dismiss us. Well, uh, bless us. As we prepare to leave here, in Jesus' name, amen. Please take a seat.